of speech, but if individual sounds were isolated from that continuous flow, they would be incomprehensible. We use context and adjust to the speaker through normalization to be able to understand language despite all the changes through assimilation, epenthesis, and elision. Parallel transmission essentially, parallel transmission is when syllables affect the pronunciation of one another. Curticulation and the bidirectional effect, discussed above, are parts of parallel transmission. The existence of parallel transmission creates the segmentation problem we cannot tell where one phoneme ends and the other begins. This causes a problem for theories of speech perception that are based around using the phoneme as the basic unit. Some critics say that if the lines between the phonemes are blurred, they are not really individual units. Because of this criticism, it has been argued that the syllable is a better basic unit of measurement for speech perception. Introduction The conversation The perception of continuous speech is a complex and difficult process. And yet, we all do this daily. Whether we are listening to a friend's funny story or to a powerful political speech, we use the steps involved in understanding of the stream of language that allows us to communicate with others. Our ability to put together and understand continuous speech is what makes communication possible. Without being able to comprehend continuous speech, we would be unable to understand what others are expressing we would be isolated. The perception of speech segments and continuous speech is a truly incredible feat of the human mind. Our perception of continuous speech is different from our perception of individual words because it is affected by the individual words and phonemes. We can never really segment thoughts into different phonemes because their property of invariance causes them to blend together. And yet, without being able to separate these individual words, people are able to understand a whole stream of these sounds that are almost unidentifiable in isolation and make sense of them. Speech segments consonant and vowel identification vowels and consonants are identified differently. When isolated, vowels have a long, steady quality. However, the sound of a vowel is strongly influenced by the sounds around it. Consonants cannot be perceived without an accompanying vowel, but they sound shorter and require less energy to produce. For example, a person cannot make the sound of a consonant, i.e., k, without expressing a vowel sound with it. Consonants have certain properties encoded for example, an unvoiced consonant is encoded differently than a stop consonant. However, in continuous speech, the cues used to identify vowels rely on the transition between the vowels and the consonants. Strange, Edmund, and Jenkins, 1979, performed a study in which people tried to identify vowels in different conditions and pairings, i.e., paired with different types of consonants in different orders. They discovered that vowels are easiest to identify when they are paired with consonants. Vowels were best identified when they were bordered on either side by consonants, but the final consonant provided more identification information than the initial consonant, Strange, Edmund and Jenkins, 1979. Thus, it appears that consonants need vowels to be perceived, and vowels need consonants to be perceived correctly. When vowels and consonants are combined, there are many effects. One such effect is assimilation, in which the letters of words are slurred together in curticulation. Assimilation occurs when the features of phonemes overlap when they are paired together. Combining consonants and vowels can result in the bidirectional effect, in which phonemes have an effect on each other in pronouncing words or phrases. Phonemes are pronounced differently in anticipation of the next phoneme or as a result of the previous phoneme. Curticulation can only occur when there is both a vowel and a consonant present. In assimilation, in the phrase come on for example, it is impossible to hear exactly where the M sound stops and the second O sound begins. The penthesis is another effect of the combinations of vowels and consonants in continuous speech. In this case, a letter or a syllable is inserted into the letter to make pronunciation easier. An example of this is how the word warmth often sounds like it contains a P towards the end of the word. This makes enunciation of the word easier in constant speech. The opposite case can also be true. In elision, a sound is omitted from the pronunciation of a word. For example, in the word February the first R sound is often omitted. Assimilation, epenthesis and elision allow us to speak and understand speech more rapidly. They are adaptations to the language to assist with the flow of pronunciation. These adjustments are also the reason we can understand a continuous flow of obstruents. Obstruents are consonant sounds produced when the vocal tract is constricted and airflow is therefore obstructed in some way. Stops, affricates and fricatives make up the obstruent class of sounds and each produce unique characteristics on a spectrogram. Stops sometimes the formant patterns appear non-existent at points on a spectrogram. This lack of activity indicates the production of a stop. If the stop is voiced, it will be shown by a series of marks along the bottom of the spectrogram. 
These marks are called a voice bar and do not occur in voiceless stops. Because there is nothing shown on the spectrogram in the presence of a stop, we cannot infer place of articulation based on the spectrogram. Phoneticians rely on surrounding sound information and transitional information, like whether there are aspiration or frication marks, to figure out which stop may be occurring. Click here to see the spectrograms of BET and RED which both contain the voiced stop D. You can see the voice bar and an absence of activity above it, as well as aspiration completing the stop. Fricatives Fricatives are the most extremely aperiodic type of sound shown on a spectrogram. They appear as irregular, vertical striations within the higher frequencies. The resonant frequencies seem to be inversely related to the size of the oral cavity, how far forward obstruction takes place, so that frequency increases as the size of the oral cavity decreases. For example, H constricts the airway toward the back of the throat so that the oral cavity is fairly large, its frequency is typically 1000 Hz F is a labiodental fricative that constricts the airway using the teeth and lip toward the front of the mouth, its frequency is higher at about 7000 Hz so, the further back constriction exists, the higher the frequency of the noisy striations from fricative on a spectrogram. Below is a spectrogram of the word sing. There is silence before the onset of the word, where you can identify the noisy, high-frequency S sound. Transitions Transitions occur when you move from a vowel or sonorant to the next consonant, recall that moving from one vowel sound to another is a diphthong. Transitions are used to identify specific stops and can reinforce what we know about fricatives. For example, transitioning from an alveolar or labial consonant to a vowel causes F2 to rise before front vowels, but lower before back vowels. If the vowel precedes the consonant, the pattern is reversed, so that F2 falls into the consonant coming from a high front vowel and will rise coming from a back vowel. By identifying vowels, which have standard formant patterns, we can work backward and infer the place of articulation of the preceding consonant, as the initial section of the second formant of a vowel can vary slightly depending on the preceding consonant. So, in the word B, we have a labial consonant B, followed by a frontal vowel I. We can easily identify the I vowel based on its unique formant pattern, and the rising of F2 with the transition into the vowel tells us that the preceding consonant could be alveolar or labial. Additionally, you can notice the voice bar at the beginning due to the voiced stop B and aspiration before the beginning of the vowel sound. Transitions are described based on a locus. A locus is a reference point at which the transition seems to originate. In the example above, the locus could be used to help determine whether the preceding consonant is alveolar or labial. Loci are specific to placement of articulation and are located in the middle of the frequency range for a particular placement. Take alveolars, for example. The highest F2 frequency occurs in transition to a front vowel and the lowest in transition to a back vowel. The locus of alveolars is located halfway between these points in the middle of the frequency range, which is approximately 1800 Hz. Bilabials have a F2 locus at about 800 Hz, and velars have a locus of 3000 Hz for front vowels and 1200 Hz for back vowels. With two high F2 loci, velars consistently fall when transitioning to vowels. Voice onset time Voice onset time VOT, is also of use when trying to identify specific speech sounds. In particular, VOT highlights differences in aspiration of stops on a spectrogram. If stops are released before voicing begins vot, we will see a puff of air that signifies aspiration. In a voiceless stop, the aspiration is represented as aperiodic waves in high frequencies, and the voicelessness continues after the stop is released. Pauses can indicate confusion or emphasis on a particular point. Speakers use pauses strategically. However, pauses are not always intentional, and some must be filtered out, or they will create confusion in the perception of continuous speech. Duas, 1985, did a study on the perception of silent pauses in speech. She tested utterance boundary pauses, pauses between syntactically independent sequences, clause boundary pauses, pauses between clauses in the utterance, constituent boundary pauses, pauses between phrases, and within constituent pauses, pauses between connected elements i.e., a pronoun and an article. In her tests, she would use normal speech and inverted speech to test the difference in pause perception. She found that in 70% of the cases, whether the speech was played normally or inverted, there was a similar perception of pauses. These results emphasize the role of prosodic features of speech, such as intonation, rhythm, and tone. She explains 30% variation through differences in semantic context. She explains that people are more likely to hear a pause when it is expected, but sometimes do not hear the pause if it is unexpected. 
Du is also determined that duration is positively correlated with the identification of pauses in speech, Du is, 1985. Continuous speech bottom-up versus top-down processing in bottom-up processing, people examine the sensory data and draw conclusions about what the sensory information means. In language, this means people hear the combination of phonemes and use that data to draw conclusions about which words are being produced. In top-down processing, the opposite happens. People think about what they expect to hear and, judging on the context, they fill in the blanks. Some researchers believe this phenomenon explains the phonemic restoration effect. The perception of continuous speech relies on the combination of bottom-up and top-down processing. People are able to listen to the available cues and understand words as they fit with the context. The combination of processing allows us to rapidly understand continuous speech. Phonemic restoration The perception of continuous speech is a huge part of daily life. It allows us to interact with others. Phonemic restoration is especially useful when talking in a situation with a lot of external noises, like in a crowded room. Phonemic restoration is the mind's ability to fill in the missing phoneme, based on the context that is presented. Warren and Warren, 1970, designed an experiment to examine phonemic restoration. They had participants come into a lab and listen to a tape in which one phoneme was removed. They used a cough paired with the word eel and put it into situations where the context affected how the subjects interpreted the word. For example, when put into a sentence involving shoes, participants heard heel instead of a cough and the word eel, Warren and Warren, 1970. The following represent additional examples. It was found that the cough eel was on the axle, cough eel was interpreted as wheel, it was found that the cough eel was on the shoe, cough eel was interpreted as heel, it was found that the cough eel was on the orange, cough eel was interpreted as peel, it was found that the cough eel was on the table, cough eel was interpreted as meal, there are two main theories regarding the process of how phonemic restoration works. The first theory is based on the sensory system. It states that the interaction between the top-down and bottom-up processing affect how the word is processed through the sensitivity effect. According to this theory, the acoustic information of a sound if affected by the context in which it is perceived. The second theory is based the cognitive representation of a word and incorporated the bias effect. In the bias effect, the top-down and bottom-up information are combined, but they do not interact as they do in the first theory. In this model, the output from the bottom-up processing system is biased by what a person is expecting via top-down processing. Gating task The gating task limits the possible choices of words the phonemes could create. An easy way to remember the gating task is through the name the gate's job is to limit the amount of people allowed onto a property, and the gating task helps limit word possibilities. People often guess what a word will be before it is said aloud based on the context on the conversation. These predictions are more accurate when more phonemic information about the word is available. Grosjean, 1980, created a task in which participants heard fragments of a word. Each fragment started at the beginning of the word and went a little longer in length. He found that there were three main points in understanding a word. The first is called the isolation point, in which the participant may be able to guess the word. The second point is called the uniqueness point, when the participant realizes there is only one word that could be correct. These two points do not necessarily yield the same word, but the idea about what the word could be is narrowed from a broad guess to a more informed evaluation. The last point is the recognition point, when the participant knows they have correctly identified the word, Grosjean, 1980. In everyday conversations, because conversations happen so quickly, there is very little time between the isolation, uniqueness and recognition point. The importance of grammar The grammar of a sentence can also strongly affect how people understand the semantics of the statement. In an experiment, Miller and Isard, 1962, played white noise with sentences. They found that the words in syntactically correct sentences were easier to recognize. Participants were able to recognize grammatical sentences, such as accidents kill motorists on highways better than anomalous, but still grammatical sentences, such as accidents carry honey between the house. The participants were most unsuccessful at perceiving words in ungrammatical sentences played with white noise, such as around accidents country honey shoot, Miller and Isard, 1962. This supports the theory of top-down processing, in that the context of the word clearly impacts people's ability to understand it, because they are expecting it. Multimodal perception The perception of continuous speech clearly does not only rely on auditory input and acoustic representation, as demonstrated by phonemic restoration. However, cognitive input is not the only process that affects how sounds are interpreted. Input from sensory systems can change how sounds are heard. 
Visual input, such a lip reading and interpreting gestures or expressions often helps us understand what people are saying. However, sometimes this input conflicts with the auditory input of a stimulus. In the McGurk effect, sometimes, although it sounds like someone is saying one word, i.e., ba, when it is combined with the visual input of another word, i.e., ga, it can create the perception of a different sound altogether, i.e., da. McGurk and MacDonald, 1976, tried to explain this phenomenon by saying that ba has more acoustically in common with da than with ga. Similarly, ga shares more visual similarities with da than with ba. This creates a fused perception of the auditory and visual processing systems. Since ba and ga are not similar on acoustic or visual fields, the brain finds a middle ground da, McGurk and MacDonald, 1976. To illustrate this point, I have included a link to a video. Watch the following link three times the first time, close your eyes and listen to the video, the second time, mute the video and watch it, and the third time, watch the video with the sound on. The video uses a visual recording of a man saying ga and pairs it with the sound recording of a man saying ba. This creates the misperception of the word da. The movement of lips also affects the perception of continuous speech. In an article written by Massaro, 2001, he summarizes a number of studies he has performed over the years. He discusses the progression of how people see speech perception and how, although it was assumed to be unimital, research has demonstrated its multimodal qualities. For example, in one study, he presented participants with an auditory, a visual, and a bimodal presentation of a phoneme. He found that people were more able to correctly identify the phonemes in the bimodal presentation than in the auditory or visual presentation. He also realized that the McGurk effect can be applied to more than just individual sounds. The auditory track of my bab pop me poo brive, paired with the visual stimulus of my gag cock me, coo grive is understood as my dad taught me to drive, Massaro, 2001. By using the McGurk effect of individual phonemes, entire strings of nonsense words can be integrated into a meaningful sentence. Green and Cull, 1991, examined the effects that place and voicing have on the perception of continuous speech. Their research supports the theory behind the McGurk effect. They concluded that the way people classify placing and voicing is not only based on the auditory system. They suggest that either visual processes wither work in parallel with auditory processes or are integrated into the auditory mechanisms, Green and Cull, 1991. Normalization people are able to normalize to a man's voice easier than to a woman's voice. When listening to a person speaks, people are able to understand what they are saying, even if they have an accent or speak very quickly. This is possible because the brain engages in normalization. There are two main forms of normalization in regards to perception of continuous speech. The first is the voice track normalization, in which a person adjusts to a speaker. Instead of trying to match up what a person is saying to the prototypical phonemes, the listener is able to compare it to the ratio of formants. Speech rate normalization is another adaptive process that allows us to adjust to the speed at which someone speaks, Rate normalization is defined as a decrease in VOT that corresponds with an increase in utterance rate. In a series of experiments, Deal, Souther and Convis, 1980, determined that the listener's ability to normalize to speech rate was greatly affected by the gender of the speaker. They found that, overall, people are able to normalize to male voice but have significantly more difficulty normalizing to a female voice. In fact, the female voice seemed to have the opposite effect. Through experimentation, they found that there are certain conditions in which the gender effect can be neutralized, including adjustments in pitch and vocal tract size, Deal, Souther and Convis, 1980. In more recent years, research in voice tract length normalization and speech rate normalization has been used in the development of technology for automatic speech recognition. In experiments conducted by Pfau, Faltlhauser and Rusk, 2001, researchers calculated an optimal warping factor to determine normalized feature vectors, which were used to aid the comprehension of automatic continuous speech. They found that by applying these vectors and using normalization, under ideal conditions, there could be up to a 17% reduction in word error rate, Pfau, Faltlhauser and Rusk, 2001. These findings may indicate that there is a way to train automated speech recognition programs to a specific voice and to recognize the changes in speech, assimilation through curticulation and parallel transmission, epenthesis, and elision for a more accurate perception of continuous speech.